began in Europe in 1914, and at that time there were a number of women, literary women, journalists who were living in Europe. Women like Edith Wharton was one, Mary Reinhardt Roberts went over, Nellie Bly, some legendary women were filing dispatches and actually getting to the front lines and covering the action. Another woman who came was a woman named Peggy Hall, and Peggy Hall was writing stories about the American training camps, and these were very popular stories. She had a very lively, engaging uh, style. Um, her articles were being published by uh, newspapers in El Paso, in Cleveland, being picked up by other newspapers. And the male journalists who were there began to get very jealous of Peggy Hall's success. But there wasn't anything they could do about it until the United States entered the war. When that happened in 1917, the male journalist complaints then reached the people in the army who told Peggy Hall she was not accredited, therefore they kicked her out. And she went back to the United States. Undeterred and determined to get her accreditation, she went to Washington and walked up and down the halls, buttoning hole anyone she could, trying to get accredited, but just met resistance upon resistance until she ran into an old friend who was a general, a General March, whom she had met when she had covered her first war, the uh, American uh, conflict with Mexico in 1916, and he wrote a letter to the officer who was refusing to accredit her, saying, if your only reason for refusing to accredit it Peggy Hall as a war correspondent is because she's a woman, issue the order immediately. And they did. And Peggy Hall became the first woman to be an accredited war correspondent. Of course, by that time, 1918, World War I had ended. So instead, she was sent to Siberia with the American Expeditionary Force. After World War I ends, there are a number of key women journalists in Europe in the 1920s and 1930s who are reporting about the aftermath of the Versailles Treaty and about the rise of Hitler and Hitler's remilitarization, the uh, passage of anti-Semitic laws, and one of the key people is a woman named Sigrid Schultz who is the bureau chief of the Chicago Tribune, the first woman to be named head of a bureau of a major American newspaper. And her dispatches are really very extraordinary. She speaks many different languages. She's very engaging. She's able to make her way into the uh, inner circle of Hitler's Confederates in, in his rise. She wrote a number of very important dispatches, including one in which she broke the news of the uh, heretofore unknown alliance, the pact between Germany and the Soviet Union. In 1940, she was reporting, uh, giving a radio broadcast during an Allied air raid over Berlin and was wounded by shrapnel. There was the assumption when the women were accredited that they would in fact cover the woman's angle. They'd write about the nurses, they'd write you know, the compassionate, they'd write the, those kinds of stories that would appeal to women. The correspondents whom I covered in my book covered what we think of as hard news. They covered battles, they covered strategy, they covered destruction. But in the minds of the bosses who sent them and the military officials who accredited, they were there to cover the woman's angle. The women didn't buy that. They covered more. Martha Gellhorn covered her first war, the Spanish Civil War, in 1936. She left America with a knapsack and $50. She covered Hitler's uh, invasion of Czechoslovakia, the attack on Finland. She covered every major war and conflict throughout her long life. When she died in 1998, she was heralded as one of the great war correspondents of her generation. When D-Day came, 
she had been accredited throughout her whole career. She was accredited to Colliers. When the word came out that D-Day was going to happen, her husband at that time, Ernest Hemingway, finally decided that he should come and cover the war. So although he could have been accredited by any magazine or newspaper in the country, he chose Colliers, which meant that Martha, because only one person could be accredited by Colliers, lost her accreditation. Undeterred, Martha Gellhorn, on the evening of the first day of D-Day, made her way to a hospital ship and told the officer that she was going to interview some nurses, which is how she got on board. Once on board, she hid herself, stowed away in the bathroom. And there she stayed until the ship got to uh, the Normandy beach. At which point she got out of the bathroom and just blended in with everyone else and went to the beach and helped carry wounded, helped stretchers, um, and wrote a dispatch about this really extraordinary adventure. Margaret Bork White uh, was a very popular and prominent photographer before World War II broke out. She, in 1941, had been the only foreign correspondent to document the German invasion of Russia. Margaret Bork White was determined to go on a bombing run. So she finally gets permission to go to North Africa, although she's told she's not allowed to fly because it's too dangerous. She'll have to go on a ship, a troop ship that's taking nurses to North Africa. She gets on this troop ship only to have a torpedo. It sinks. She saves two of her six cameras, spends eight hours in a lifeboat before uh, being rescued. When she gets to North Africa, the general says, well, since you've already been torpedoed, you can go on a bombing run. She spends a week getting ready, so she practices in the hot desert so that she can maneuver. Goes on the bombing run. gets extraordinary pictures. Her pr plane is shot uh, several times, although lightly damaged, and two of the bombers on the bombing run actually are shot down. Margaret Bork White continues to, to get herself in the heart of the action. She covers the campaign in Italy. She's at Buchenwald when it's liberated, and she provides an extraordinary photographic record of all the various campaigns in Europe of World War II. Marguerite Higgins gets accredited and arrives in Europe in April 1945, and she's at Buchenwald when it's liberated. Uh, while she's there, she hears a rumor that another large concentration camp is going to be liberated. It turns out it's Dachau, and she hooks up with uh, Sergeant Peter First, who writes for Stars and Stripes, who has a jeep, and they head off for Dachau. When they're getting closer, they hear that there's fighting still going on at the north end, so they head for the south end and discover that not only is fighting has fighting ceased, but the German general and the guards basically surrender to them. So Marguerite Higgins and Peter First are the um, correspondents who inform the um, inmates of the concentration camp that they're free. After World War II ends, Marguerite Higgins uh, continues writing for the Herald Tribune. Uh, in the, by 1950, she's appointed the bureau chief in Japan. She's there when the Korean War breaks out. A huge military force swept down from North Korea across the 38th parallel. And she's one of the first reporters on the scene. Uh, when she arrives, the general uh, throws her out, no women. Uh, she appeals to General Douglas MacArthur, who reverses the order and sends a telegram saying that the ban on women journalists has been lifted. She receives a Pulitzer Prize for her coverage in Korea, the first woman, making her the first woman to win a Pulitzer for international reporting. She then uh, covers uh, Vietnam. During her time in going to Vietnam, she contracts a deadly a tropical disease and um, during her hospitalization she knows she's dying she's writing columns for Newsday and she continues writing them while she is lying dying and she does in fact die at the age of 45.
Dickie Chappelle, who was in her mid-twenties, mid was uh, an accomplished photographer who was accredited to cover the war in the Pacific. Her task was to take photographs of blood transfusions that the military could use for campaigns in the states to encourage blood donors. She went forward from Guam on a hospital ship with the nurses where she took photographs of transfusions of wounded soldiers. Uh, she took photographs on Iwo Jima and then on April 1st she got on Okinawa to take photographs at a field hospital and she was under orders to return that same day to the ship. However, heavy winds came up, the, they were unable to do a pickup, she was stranded and in fact she ended up being stranded for six days all the while there were kamikaze attacks, it was their snipers, they were strafing. There was an order out to arrest her for defying the order to return to the ship that night. Finally, on the sixth day, uh, the order apparently had been escalated to shoot on site. So a Marine told Dickey, at which point she surrendered. She was taken back to the hospital ship, taken to Guam, where she was then stripped of her accreditation. So that was the end of World War II for Dickey. However, she continued to cover the Marines, including going with them to Vietnam, where she made 30 parachute jumps, went on many patrols, took many iconic photographs. Uh, tragically, in 1965, she was killed while on patrol with the Marines um, when a landmine exploded, and thus Dickie Chappelle died covering the war, the first female war correspondent to be killed in action. After the war, many of the women did in fact continue their career. We don't know about many of them today because they weren't written into the history books. They weren't, didn't become part of the historical narrative of World War II. They're not featured in documentaries, but they're there. The numbers of women in journalism drops because as the men returned, they took back those jobs or they took over their jobs so that by 1968, there were fewer women foreign correspondents than there had been even in the pre-war years. It took the feminist revolution, legal changes, attitudinal changes of the 1970s to begin to make inroads in journalism to open the door, but it really wasn't until the 1990s where there was a, the big push that we've now seen that it has opened the door wider for women today. Americans are very frustrated that they're are safe havens for the terrorists and assessments or recommendations, if you will, certainly with an awareness of the context in which they're offered. The Marines are hoping to have the element of surprise. Never been all the way in water that's often up to their necks. Life is slowly returning to Marja now that the Taliban has been cleared out. The challenge will be keeping it that way.